Okay, I, I started a study, um, the book of Job, earlier in the week and thought I'd uh, get a lesson uh, on Job for today, but uh, it didn't pan out that way. <laughs> I only got into the first, first two chapters. And uh, so there's a, a lot to be said about what he says there in the first two chapters. And I'd like you to, to have a look uh, with me. Um, but um, it basically, it's talking about Satan and about uh, how, how he operates in heaven and how he operates on the earth and how he's restricted by the power of God. And uh, there's good information here for us because we need to know a little bit about the devil and Satan. Uh, it's not often that people preach about it, but uh, he's, he's in the background and he's invisible to our eyes. So most people in the world just, uh, you know, think the devil is that, that uh, cartoonish thing, you know, with the red face and, uh, uh, and the tail coming out and, and uh, you know, uh, and it's innocent enough looking and funny enough looking, but he's not funny and he's not innocent. You can back, bet, back uh, or bet on that for sure, because that's what's revealed here. Uh, the start of the book of Job says there was a, a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job. And the man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Now it's wonderful, wonderful to be confronted straight away with the fact that there was a man back probably in the time of the patriarchs who was an upright man. Uh, who was uh, fearing God and who was turning away from evil. So there has been people who have been faithful to God uh, and, uh, and his word all through the centuries. And we, we will, when we get to heaven, we we'll probably meet Job. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, by the end of his life everything was working out well for him again but uh, he went through a lot of difficulty um, it says he had seven sons he was a very rich man he seemed to be a judge uh, uh, for, for the area where he was in uh, he, was, uh, he was a man of real integrity he was well known and he was a wise man, considered one of the wise men. And uh, he had seven sons, th three daughters were born to him. His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of, uh, yokes, yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the East. That's quite a claim for, for Job. Now, uh, the problem isn't Job. The problem was what was going on in the background, which Job knew nothing about. And we're introduced to that in verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now, these sons of God were angels, sons of God. And, they, and Satan presented himself among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking about around on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Now the devil is challenging God. And um, in, in this competition, if I could describe it that way, in this encounter between God and Satan, Job happens to be the object of it. And God is 
pronouncing Job a righteous man. Now, God, for God to do that, that's all you want on the day of judgment, that God would consider you holy and blameless and beyond reproach. And that's what we're all looking for at the end of the day. And that will be, of course, by the mercy of God. Now, I think God was pronouncing this by the standard of their day and time, where he was, he was so keen to do everything that was right. He was so sharp in his mind with regard to what God expected of him and his responsibility towards God and his fellow man. He was, he was I, I mean, he was a spiritual giant is what he was. He was an incredible man because... When, when you see what he was prepared to do, it was uh, I incredible. I mean, give, given I didn't read uh, verse 5 there, but uh, it, it shows it came about when the days of <coughs> feasting had, uh, had uh, completed their cycle, that Job would send and consecrate, it and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Just thus Job did continually, we're told. So it's, it's quite, um, he, he was not only conscientious for himself, he was conscientious for his family and he was acting as a priest now the patriarchs were priests. They were the head, head of their families, usually a head of a clan, and they would act as priests on behalf of the whole family. And, and, and it's, it's a, a point that needs to be made. The, the men are supposed to be priests for their family, even in the present day. And we must consider that uh, you have a responsibility, as Job had, to pray for their well-being, to pray for the fact that they might have sinned against God and be asking God to forgive them of their sins and to, uh, to help them to see what they need to do in order to be saved. I think that that's a responsibility that we need to take on. It's, uh, it's been such a long time since uh, people have understood that, that we need to be reintroduced to it and understand it now. Uh, anyway, so that's, that's how conscientious this man was. And notice how dev the devil makes an accusation against him. He says, you, you take away what he's got. You've, you've given him so much. You've hedged him about. You've protected him. He's lived, uh, he's lived a, a great life. But now you take away those possessions and all that he has and you watch and see, the devil says, that he'll curse you to, his, to your face. So <clears throat> God obviously knew Job a lot better than the devil did and I don't know whether the devil was just provoking God uh, and trying to destroy Job because he hadn't been able to get at him any other way. So he says uh, in verse, it says in verse 11, the Lord said to, the, to Satan um, that he will curse you to your face. In verse 12, then the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. And on that day, Job lost everything. He lost his possessions. He lost his sheep, his camels, his oxen, his female donkeys, his servants. And he lost his seven children. Tragically, uh, in a tragedy, he lost those seven children. Um, you, you need to read it yourself. It's worth reading. Now, I tell you, if I, I, I was reading it and I'm thinking to myself, hold on, this, this, if, you re if I really think about this, this is phenomenal, uh, that he could uh, actually endure what he had to endure. If you had one of your ch children to die, to die, would you not feel aggrieved? If you had a big family and all of your children died on the same day, would you not feel even 
more aggrieved if your grandchildren were taken away from you would you not feel grieved if all your possessions and everything you had were taken away from you as lo along with the children would that not break your heart would that not mean would that not make you feel that God has like, totally abandoned you that you're of no value whatsoever and we wouldn't be falling from the height that this man was falling from with all his possessions, his power and his authority, his dignity, the honor that was given to him, his wisdom and understanding. You just don't expect a man like this to have such disasters in his life. But the devil was making sure and was trying to break him so that he would curse God. Fortunately, this man endured what he had to face there. He said in verse 21, well, verse 20, 21 in chapter 1, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I have come from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. And he's, he's right not to blame God. Although God gave permission, God didn't want this to happen. But now that it's happened, he was going to help him through it. And the thing is, Job understood God was a good God that he was a good God but the God of this world Satan himself he was having a field day here destroying and corrupting everything that this man had and yet the man didn't curse God to God's face he didn't blame God he recognized look all that I have has come from God he gave it to me and now he has the right to take it away. Listen to that. He has the right to take it away. Who do I think I am? Because I've amounted, or I've amounted a, 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 a sizable amount of possessions. And have some money in the bank. And feel secure where I'm at in life. To where nothing if it goes on this way everything's going to be great and I'm sure there were days that Job thought that as well he was in a tub of butter he thought it would go on forever and you do think that when you're young you really do think that when you're young you have no idea of what's ahead of you and what can happen to you and what disasters can come your way we have no idea but whatever comes and this is the consolation the Christian has. Whatever comes, we've got an anchor. And it's, and, it's, and it's bound to that rock, which is Christ and the love of God and the mercy of God and the kindness of God and all that is God. And that God is on our side and we can trust him. We don't have to start feeling sorry for ourselves. I mean, you're hurt. So I can see the man crying for his family. I don't think he was that hard-hearted. And he must have felt the terrible pain of it all. But he accepted it. And controlled his tongue when it happened. So the devil gets the second bite of the cherry here in chapter 2. And it says in verse 3, he presented himself again on, this, on another day. And the Lord said to Satan, verse 3 of chapter 2, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. 
Now God is recognizing that what's happening to Job is without cause. Job didn't deserve it. Job didn't live a life that, that required it. It was without cause. And Satan answered and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you to his face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power, only spare his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head and he took a pot chair to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. The ashes is, the, is where they would dump all their ashes. It was, a, it was a dump. He was out there now, not as the, not as the chief of the chieftains, uh, not as the judge of the people, not as the wise man and the richest man in the, in, in the whole of the East. He was out there in his poverty having lost everything and now having lost his health and his strength he's out there scraping himself with potsherds and he's in a terrible state a terrible state and who has inflicted it on him? the devil he was glad to do it that's, that's what he, he thrives on that's what he's all about The, these two incidents remind me of uh, uh, in in the New Testament. Um, let's go, let's go to Luke. Yeah, go to Luke chapter thirteen. Verse ten, and he was teaching in the, one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who was who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit and she was bent over double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her and immediate, immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. And then there was this complaint about, what are, you do, what are you doing? You're doing work on the Sabbath day. It's not supposed to, you can come any day of the week. Don't do it today. Today is not the day to be healing people. And Jesus answered, we're told, verse 15, the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, do not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from this stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan had bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. See, the, the, devil, the devil is the one who inflicts sickness on us. And he, he does this to break us, to make us feel like we're abandoned, to make us feel that we are, you know, not special in God's eyes, to make us feel like, well, we've done something really wrong. And it might not be anything really wrong. We know from uh, John chapter 9, uh, the apostles and Jesus were passing a man born blind, and they asked him, uh, uh, is it because this man sinned or his parents sinned that he's in this state? And Jesus says it's neither, neither did he nor his parents sin to bring him into this state. He says, but this is for the glory of God because he was going to heal him. Now Job's, Job's temptation was, of course, losing everything and uh, uh, so that he would be broken and that he would then turn on God as a result of that. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen, much to his credit, it didn't happen. Now, he's got a lot of complaints because he doesn't understand what's going on. 
He's, he feels that God is treating a righteous, righteous people like he treats the evil people. As a matter of fact, he feels sometimes he's treating the evil people better than he's treating a righteous person. And he feels this is what's happening in his own case. How can you do this, Lord? This, this can't be right. This isn't consistent with your character. He was, he was really upset with that. And we're going to see later on how he complained about that. But, uh, but this, the devil is able to inflict us with sicknesses and diseases and he relishes this power over us to break us and to make us feel uh, that God is not in control. But he is in control. Now, in Luke chapter 22, I was giving the two illustrations as to how the devil um, has power. In Luke chapter 22, um, it says in verse 31, uh, <clears throat> Jesus talking now, he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail and you when once you have turned again strengthen your brethren he says now Satan's before God and, and Peter we, we know poor Peter he, he was uh, he was a big mouth he, he had uh, he was always he always has the answers he always has to uh, be up front and uh, uh, and, and speak for the other the, the apostles and so forth but he often put his foot in it too many times he put his foot in it and the devil saw this weakness in him and now he's, he's trying to exploit it in, in God he's demanding of God that he would sift him like wheat in other words he thinks he's the husk that, uh, that there's no wheat in him and that he's going to, going to work it so that he would be cast out. And Jesus tells him that the devil has demanded it, he's going to get his way. But I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail through this trial, through this difficulty. Now we know what happened when Peter followed Jesus into... Um, the, the high priest's uh, courtyard that, uh, that he was confronted a number of times you're, a, you're, a, you're with him you're one of these fellows you're, you're with him I don't know he, back, he began to curse and swear and say I don't know the man uh, how can you get from I'll never leave you I'll stand with you I'll die with you to, I, I don't know the man. Don't be talking to me like this. He's, he's somebody I haven't been with. I don't know. And cursing and swearing to make them feel like he's one of them rather than a disciple of Christ. That was a huge trial. Now fortunately Jesus happened to pass by and uh, caught his eye at this point in time in the courtyard and he realized what he had done. And he broke down and he sobbed unconsolably in repentance. What a trial. But at least he had the, he had the wherewithal to, to say to God he was sorry for what he had done, that it was wrong, sinful, disgraceful. And it was a terrible reflection on him. But he would, must have remembered Jesus' words, I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And then when you've returned, you encourage the brethren. See how easy it is to be caught in the snares of the devil and how easy it is for him to break us. And we need to understand that that's, that's, what he, that's how he can work on us and he can break us. He can make life so miserable for us. He can make us so unhappy with ourselves and with, with, our, uh, with our situations in life that we, 
We, we, we don't know what to do other than to say, I don't care about it at all. I'm giving it all up. I couldn't care less. He's got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. We need to be very careful. We need to know what our enemy is like. We need to know what our enemy is like. And the one thing that we know about him is that he's an accuser of the brethren. He spends his time night and day accusing us before God. And God help us all because there's so much that he can say to God about each and every one of us as to where our failings are and what we're doing and how badly we're serving God and how hypocritically we're living from day to day. You know, serving ourselves, not thinking about God, not doing the right things for God, not, not having a relationship with God. It's just we're going through the motions. We're just going through the motions. And when it's all external, it's not acceptable to God either. We can be doing right, but we're doing it for ourselves. This is the way, this is the pattern of living I've got into. I can continue that on and it will look like everything's going grand. I go to church on Sunday, I go on Wednesday, um, I, can, I, I know all the right words to say, but really the heart is empty of real spirituality and the heart is empty of real commitment to God and to the truth of God. That's the danger. And don't tell me it's not a danger, I'm telling you it's a danger. And I'm warning you it's a danger. When, you, when you're not among the brethren, when you're out there on your own, and the devil is having a field day in your life, you are a target and you can be brought down. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. He warns the brethren. Peter warns the brethren. He says, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. This, this being who, uh, who, we, who we believe was an angel who was before God's throne uh, and uh, God made him uh, high ranking and he fell from his position. He decided and I'll, uh, maybe I'll look at that in just a minute. He decided that he was going to rebel against God and thought he could be equal with God. And ever since he's fallen he's opposed to God and he's a He's opposed to God's son. He's opposed to God's people. And he wreaks havoc wherever he goes. He's a destroyer. And a liar. But he seeks. He's, he prowls about, uh, about as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him firm in your faith. Knowing that the same experience of sufferings is being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. You're not the only one who's suffering. You're not the only one who feels let down. You're not the only one who is inconsistent or hypocritical. You're not the only one who needs help. You're not the only one. Brethren all over the world, no matter where they are, are enduring the same temptations, the same sicknesses, the same problems that we're enduring. We're not on our own. 
That's why we need to talk to each other and encourage each other and try and give a little bit of insight if you have insight and understanding and be caring and loving and showing, showing interest in each other. We need to be doing this because where is the support mechanism if it's not in the church and among the brethren? Live like you're an island. Live like there's nobody else in the world if that's what you want to do. But don't think that that's what's right in the church among the brethren before God or Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not. We need to be caring enough for other people and for ourselves for that matter to share and to encourage. We're here to encourage each other. We're here to build each other up. We're not here to entertain each other or get pats on the back from each other. We're here to sacrifice ourselves as we should be doing every day of our lives, taking up our cross and following Jesus Christ. We need to be giving rather than looking to receive. Who's going to, who's going to talk to me today? Who's going to give me attention? Who's going to, who's going to say a, a nice word to me? Well, if you're sitting there in your chair and you're not even willing to say hello or welcome to the service today to others, what are you doing? We need to start thinking about others, not about ourselves. And we need more especially to think about God rather than myself. And be taken up in the Spirit to God and to Jesus Christ our Lord. To follow in His path, to, to, to let Him lead us in His light, to be like Him, to be humble and meek and kind and caring. That's what we need to be doing. That's what we need to be doing. The forces that are against us are phenomenal. The spiritual forces of wickedness. We'll look in um, uh, Ephesians. First of all, go to chapter 2, <clears throat> where he reminds the Christians. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That's where we were at before we heard the gospel. That's where we were at before we were baptized and identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We were dead, spiritually dead, separated from God, hell bound in our trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. You were living by the standards the world has set. You were living for yourself. You didn't mind telling lies. You didn't mind stealing. You didn't mind being greedy. You didn't mind any of that. That was, way, that's, that was life. That's the way it is. And I was part of it. But he says, it was according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. You were hoodwinked. You weren't serving yourself, you were serving, serving Satan. You were doing the wrong that he wanted you to do, contrary to the will of God to do right in your life. And we didn't think much about it. That's the way it is. But you were under someone else's power. And the power that you were under was the power of the devil. Who was the god of this world. The god of this world. He's described as the ruler of this world. 
Now look at Ephesians chapter 6. He says in verse 10, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. This, these are in the heavenly places now, not just the rulers on earth. The rulers against the powers in the heavenly places, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And who is the leader of all these forces? The devil himself, Satan, the wicked one, our enemy. He's caused war in heaven and war on earth. We're seeing in the news now what war is like, destructive. See those buildings and towns blown up to pieces where people lived for a lifetime. To see them driven out, having nowhere to sleep, no water or food to eat. Shocking. But whose doing is it? It's Satan provoked. And it's humans who want to do their own will which is evil and satisfy the will of the devil which is evil and he encourages and he incites them to do what he wants him, them to do so that he will have his way with human beings which, and his way is, is the way of death and destruction. It's not, it's not all so blatant. Most of it is subtle. Most of what the devil is doing is subtle. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says this as a, as a warning to the brethren. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Missing out on, on it. Uh, <clears throat> he, he talks about uh, how. What am I? I've gone blank now. Um, he talks about the, the deception, the, the deception of David, or of, of, uh, of the deception of the devil, and he's he's talking about how that he, be, he can make himself an angel of light. Uh, and he can deceive us by being presenting himself as an angel of light to you. Uh, and it's, it's easy for him to do this through those who are willing to lie uh, and pervert the, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and to teach you of, an, of another way, a worldly way, a way that will satisfy you and satisfy the world and make you, uh, make you uh, acceptable in your society, a way that is of the world. He, he, he presents himself as an angel of light. We need to be careful what we're listening to. We need to be careful what we're believing. We need to check from the Word of God what is right and what is wrong. We need to continue to measure everything by what the Word of God says. It's absolutely essential that we do that. If you don't know what the Word of God says, if you're not studying, if you're not studying, <clears throat> I want to ask you, I don't want you to answer this, answer it in your own head. What study have you put in this week of the Word of God? If you, were, if you were doing an exam, 
What effort would you put in to pass that exam? Oh, monumental effort. Monumental research. Monumental discipline. Why? Because it's what I want. It's something that I can achieve. Well, why don't you want the Word of God? Why don't you see there's achievement in, on, in learning the Word of God and understanding it and teaching it to others? Why don't you see that as a goal in your life and put the same effort into it that you would if you were doing an exam to further your career so that you can make more money, so that you can be well off in this life, why don't you further your spirituality so that you'll be well off in terms of God, of God's approval and of Christ's image in your life? Why don't we work towards that and make the effort that we're putting into this world and to my security and my advancement in life? The, de the devil has snares. He lays snares for us, traps us. And we walk into them because we're not looking for the snares. And we need to, we, we just need to realize, had Jesus not come, and God sent him to save us, of course, but God sent him all, as well to bring Satan down. Uh, is it uh, Luke chapter 11, I think, or ch Luke chapter 10. Oh. Yeah, Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. I was watching him fall from heaven like lightning. Who was going to bring him out of heaven? Who was going to drag him down? Who was going to cast him out? Jesus Christ was going to do it. He was the only one who could do it for us. In <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12, it says this in verse 7, and there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard the loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony and they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has come down to you having great wrath knowing that he has only a short time. So, Jesus has made it that the devil has been thrown out of heaven. He fell like lightning from heaven. Jesus saw him falling, as it were. But he's here, and he knows that his time is short, and he is doing everything in his power to destroy as many humans, and particularly those who have committed their lives to God, to destroy as many of their lives as he possibly can. And he will heap all sorts of trials and tribulations, all sorts of lies and insults, all sorts of things 
in our lives or onto our lives to draw us away from the truth of God and from what is right. Now the devil will be defeated and he'll be defeated by God. He'll be cast into hell and it's the place that had been prepared for the devil and his angels. He'll be cast into hell and the angels who followed him will be cast into hell. And all those humans who've committed to serving him will be cast into hell. And all of those who have not got their names in the Lamb's Book of Life will be cast into hell. It's a shocking day that's coming in. And it's, and it's ahead of all of us. And we're going to face it. We're going to be there. Whether you remain faithful or not, you're going to be there. You're going to see it happen. The thing is, once we're with Christ and doing what Christ is promising to us uh, or asking us to do, uh, we, will, we will have a victory over him. Um, I think it's uh, Romans chapter 16. Where he makes this promise to us. The God of peace, verse 20, will soon crush Satan under your feet. Now he's, he's going to be crushed under Christ's feet, but we stand with Christ. He's going to be crushed under our feet, but it will be soon. So we, I, I'm just bringing it to your attention what we're having to face and whom we're having to face and how difficult it is in our own strength to face him. It's impossible in our own strength to face him. He's more powerful, more intelligent, more destructive than anybody that you'll ever meet in life. And we haven't got the wherewithal unless Christ is with us and we're with Christ. Without that, it's not going to happen. So that's about as much as I can say. There's, oh, there's plenty more to say, too much more to say. I could go on for another hour, but this is the time I've, it's been allotted to me for this morning. I hope that it's opened your eyes. I hope it'll make you more sober-minded. I hope you will see that this life is short, that you cannot know what's going to happen to you in the future, you might think everything is going swimmingly for you, everything is perfect, everything is the way I want it, but that doesn't mean it's going to continue that way. You will be tested. You will be tested. The question in your mind should be, can I withstand the pressure? Can I believe in, in all of those difficulties that God is a good God and trust him? Even though I don't know what's going on, can I still trust him? Even if he slays me, can I still trust him? That's the question. That's the question. Lord willing, you will say, I trust the Lord. And keep faith with him until the end. We leave it there for today. Thank you.